Important notes about online learning. On the course page, you'll find a very useful document with some hints and tips on how to manage your data and to reduce your data consumption. Download the slides and go through them along with the video or audio and please pay special attention to the lecture outcomes. The outcomes tell you what you need to be able to do in order to pass the assessment. This means that the outcomes define the scope of your assessment. You still need to make notes and try and express things in your own words and this is going to be very important for your own understanding. You still need to go through the prescribed reading and do the exercises and you still need to explore further through additional reading, online investigation, for instance, YouTube has some wonderful linguistic resources. Remember that your evidence of engagement will all be part of your portfolio. Every lecturer hopes that all students do these things anyway. But when you are doing online learning from home, the opportunities to do so are quite different. It becomes even more important that you do these things. You will need to manage your own time and take responsibility for your own learning. Hold tight and enjoy the lecture. In the previous weeks, we've covered some of the main properties of natural language, focusing on hierarchical structure and constituency. And from that, we developed a basic theory, if you like, about what syntactic structures might look like. And those look like something like the trees that we developed during Linguistics 1. In the coming weeks, we're going to be refining these ideas and exploring whether the Linguistics 1S style tree is sufficient to analyze and represent natural language. And along the way, we're going to be developing our theory and learning more about syntax. Let's start off by thinking about universal grammar. After all, the aim of syntactic theory is not only to create structures that explain the way natural language is and is spoken, but is also a theory about how language must be in the mind. Now, I am 100% certain that language has a biological component. In other words, there's something in our brain which predisposes us to learn language. Now, there are a number of open questions about this. The first is, is this ability human-specific or shared with other animals? Over the last 70 years or so, there's been a lot of research attempting to find language correlates in other species, and the results have been less than inspiring. Relatively recently, some limited types of recursion have been identified in certain kinds of songbirds, and it has been known for quite a long time that apes, such as chimpanzees and gorillas, are capable of learning a lexicon. However, even after very intensive training, even the most successful apes learn only a couple of hundred words, and many of the less successful ones might learn only 10 or 20. This is different to human children, which manage to learn not only words, but structures without intensive training. And the nature of their lexicon is very different, both qualitatively and quantitatively. Qualitatively, human children learn words of different types, including highly abstract words and filler words. And quantitatively, human children have a lexicon approaching many thousands of words. So it seems that the language ability, or what Chomsky calls the language faculty, is uniquely human. The other open question is how specific is, is this ability? There are two general positions around this, the cognitivist position and the innatist position, and there's some overlap between the two. The cognitivists claim that language ability is just like any other computation in the brain. It uses general cognitive principles such as analogy, generalization, and other learning mechanisms. The innatist position claims that language has phenomena which seem qualitatively different to other cognitive phenomena. In other words, the language ability seems to be quite specific. For instance, it's not easy to find instances of agreement, movement, etc. in, say, the visual system. Innatists claim it is impossible to learn a natural language unless some aspects are pre-specified in the brain, and these things that are pre-specified would be universal grammar. So with that in mind, let's re-examine our representations that we've been developing. Remember that a syntactic representation is not merely the structure of the sentence, but a hypothesis about the way language is in our minds. So when you look at the S-style trees that we learned in, about in Linguistics 1, there are a number of problems with them. First of all, there are a number of good empirical reasons, and the YouTube video by Dr. Nima Abu Salim takes you through those very effectively. I would definitely recommend that you look at that video 
the trees we've been developing also seem very language specific. For instance, while it is entirely possible to create an S-style tree for Japanese or Isikosa, the rules that we would need to do so might not bear any similarities to the English style rules. This of course is going to be a problem because if we are claiming that languages are universal and that there must be commonalities between different languages, then having rules that are very language specific ends up being something of a problem. So we need to have a theory that not only captures how languages are different, but also how they are the same, and the S-bar tree doesn't seem to do that very effectively. The tree also has a number of structures that seem very ad hoc. Ad hoc is originally a Latin phrase, and it more or less means made up on the fly without any deep principles motivating it. So for instance, if you look at the structure of the sentence, it breaks into an S and a VP, and that is quite different to the structure of a noun phrase, which breaks up into a determiner, optional adjectives and nouns. And that is quite different in turn from a prepositional phrase, which breaks up into a, into a P and an NP. What this means is that children must learn the different structures associated with noun phrase, verb phrase, prepositional phrases, etc. And if there's no commonality between them, then it makes the task fairly difficult. So if we pursue this type of structure, then it seems to me that it won't begin to explain something really important, and that is how the language system is acquired by children. These trees also predict numerous linearizations that are impossible, and this stems from the fact that any node can break up into a number of different branches. So if you look at the tree on the slide, the verb phrase breaks into a verb, noun phrase one, noun phrase two, and an adverbial. The fact that these are all branching at the same level implies that these branches can be switched around. But that would clearly yield incorrect results. So for instance, it would not be possible to take the verb and swing it around to the end of the verb phrase, yielding something like, what exciting things will mark us today teach? Linked to this is that the structures we've been creating can end up with quite large ennery branching nodes. So we could end up with two nodes, three nodes, eight, ten. Are there any limitations to how many no nodes you can have? Surely a million would be too much. So if our sentence tree as it currently stands is a hypothesis about universal grammar, there are a number of shortcomings. So let's examine what universal grammar might actually be. So let's put our tree aside for the moment and ask ourselves, what structure do we minimally need to capture the kinds of features of language that we've been talking about so far? So at a very simple level, we need to be able to link words, or perhaps features, into bigger structures. That process we're going to call merge. So merge is the process of take two features and linking them together to create a bigger set, or taking a set of words and merging them with another set of words to create a bigger phrase or a clause, etc. So that seems to be a minimal thing that we need. We also need to be able to capture the fact that words and features chunk together into constituents. So let's assume that we take a preposition and a noun phrase and we merge those to together to create uh, some kind of constituents, and that would project uh, a level, if you like, or project a head, just that we can call that node something and identify it properly. And this would, this, so this could be a simple tree structure. The question is, is this structure enough to capture natural language? Well, the answer is that it's not, for the reasons that Dr. Nimu Abu Salim outlines. Broadly put, if we only allow one level of projection, then we predict that each constituent can only be quite small. We would also need a separate rule that told us we can only have one level of projection. So sticking with our example of a prepositional phrase, how big can it be? You could have an example like, it is at the right time, we have a preposition, and a simple noun phrase afterwards. But you can also modify the preposition to end up with the following kind of sentence, it is more or less the right time. Now, if we only allowed one level of projection, we'd end up with a structure at the bottom of the screen, for instance, with an adverbial projects an A and is merge with a P, and this would then predict that that whole structure is an adverb. But our constituency tests clearly show that more or less at the right time is not an adverb, but is actually a prepositional phrase. So one way of getting around that 
is to allow projection, which we've already assumed to be available in the grammar, to take a less restricted role. For instance, let's imagine that the preposition projects a intermediate node. Let's call that P bar or P1. And then we can also project above that something called prepositional phrase. And potentially we can project higher than that as well. What this would do is create spaces where we could modify the preposition and so capture the ability to have larger constituents. What's also really interesting about this projected structure that we've created is that it is the minimal structure which includes a C command asymmetry. For instance, the adverbial can C command the preposition and the noun phrase, but the preposition and the noun phrase cannot C command the adverbial. If we did not have that additional PP level, there would not be a C command asymmetry. So intuitively, this seems an elegant solution as it is the minimal or the smallest building block that can capture both constituency and asymmetric C command, which we've been talking about so far. So let's take the structure and generalize it into something like the following shape. We might start out with a head. We, let's call that X0. We're using X as a placeholder here. It could be a noun, a verb, a complementizer, or any other word, and it would project an X bar and an XP. This creates a number of positions for modification. Most notably, the specifier, also called the spec, is the daughter of the XP, and the head can select a complement via the X bar node, and this whole structure itself can be the complement of a higher selecting head. So I'd like to explore the possibility that this structure is the core building block of all human language. Another way of thinking about it is as a small Lego piece. There are a number of fairly large Lego pieces on the slide, and we might want to ask ourselves the question, what is the smallest possible Lego piece that would make sense? And it would be something like the little red block. And if we had enough of these little red blocks, we could create any other Lego piece that we wanted to. So in the same way that the Lego block is the basic structural unit of Lego, the X bar structure is the basic structural unit of human language. To extend the parallel a bit further, we might want to say that the block itself is the head. The specifier where you can adjoin other things is the little nobular on the left hand side. And this block itself can be selected by another shape and underneath it can hook onto another shape. So there are a number of interesting parallels between this minimal Lego-like structure and an X-bar structure. So summing up then, we might want to assume this kind of X-bar structure because it's the smallest unit that encodes relationships between words and phrases, that encodes constituency, and also encodes asymmetric hierarchy. So how would we use this small structure to create larger ones? Well, a key element of that is something called selection. Selection is the kind of constituent that a category absolutely must occur with. For instance, a transitive verb like like must have an object. For instance, I like KFC box masters. We call this obligatory complement. We say that like selects a complement of some kind. In this case, it's a noun phrase. Incidentally, the verb like can also select an infinitival clause, as in, I like to eat KFC box masters. Let's contrast the verb no with the verb like. Just like like, no requires some kind of complement, and it could be a noun phrase. For instance, you could say, I know John. Just like like, no can also take a sentence complement. But where it's different to like is that it must select a finite complement. I know that KFC box masters are nice to eat. It is quite odd to say, I know to eat KFC box masks. Although there are similarities between verbs, and we can put them into broad categories like transitive verbs, intransitive, and ditransitive verbs, it seems that many verbs have their own selectional requirements. For instance, the verb put requires both a noun phrase and a locative complement, such as a prepositional phrase. So you can say, Jack put the book on the table, but you cannot say, Jack put the book. This ungrammatical sentence shows us that the verb put selects two complements. So the basic idea here is that different categories select other categories, and we can illustrate this with verbs, but it is also something we can extend to all other categories. So it's quite important to know what categories can be selected by other categories. 
And for now, I want you to memorize the following selectional relationships. To create a basic clausal structure, a complementizer selects a tense. Tense selects a, something called a little v, which we will discuss in later lectures. And little v selects something called big V, again, which we will discuss in later lectures. A determiner selects a noun. A preposition selects a determiner. A noun may optionally select a complementizer, yielding something like relative clauses. Verbs have a wide variety of possible selectional templates that they can use. Some verbs will select a complementizer, some select a tense or an infinitival clause, some verbs might select another verb, some verbs might select a, a D for a determiner, and some might select a prepositional phrase. It really just depends on the verb we're talking about. There are also some optional categories. For instance, an adverbial can select a complementizer, which might select tense. And tense might optionally select negation, and negation might optionally select more adverbials, etc. This is simply because adverbials and negation tend not to occur in every single sentence, whereas tense and verbs typically do. Where are these selectional relationships stored? Well, they are actually properties of the individual lexical items. So a complementizer has a feature on it, which states that it must select a tense. A verb has a feature on it, which states which kind of complement it must select. So ultimately, these selectional relationships are stored as feature values in the lexicon. So having outlined how a basic X-bar structure might work, let's see if we can build larger structures out of it. So let's start out with our basic X-bar structure with a head projection, a head phrase, if you like, and let's imagine that this particular head selects another kind of head and we would merge those together and that's represented by the blue line and this process can be repeated more or less infinitely now that we've done this abstractly let's see what a basic sentence might look like using this building block approach we might start with a verb eat which projects a x bar structure culminating in a verb phrase that is selected by tense which projects its own x bar structure the tense in its specifier might have a noun which is projecting a noun phrase and this would yield something like she eats. The power of this approach is that a small fairly compact basic unit of human language can be used iteratively to build very complex structures. If this basic building block is specified in the universal grammar in the child's mind then crudely put it takes away a little bit of the complexity of language learning. When a child hears a sentence, they know immediately it must be composed of these basic building blocks. The remaining question for the child then is in what particular configuration these basic building blocks apply. The other advantage is that it gives us a hold over something that might be universal in all human language. If we assume that all human languages are built of these basic building blocks, then we can start to explain why human languages might have certain properties in common, while the different ways that they can be configured might be able to explain the differences between human languages. There are hundreds of languages that have been described using X-bar theory and generative grammar. 